What is going on guys? This video is going to be all about learning AWS. Uh, by far the most common question that I get asked is where do you get started learning AWS? What are some projects that you can do to just get yourself familiar with it? And usually what I do is tell people to start with the AWS Cloud Practitioner course, which is a great resource that's offered by AWS. So you can get familiar with some of the different services, some of the different concepts that you need to know in order to get started. Now, after you get familiar with some of the concepts, the next question is how do I actually learn this stuff in a more practical way? Because that course teaches you a lot of the different things, but it doesn't really tell you about what are things that people are actually working on? What are skills or, or patterns that people are using or technologies that people are using that are useful for me to get a job? And that's what this video is going to be about. It's going to be about a variety of different projects that you can learn from a very practical perspective of what people are actually doing with AWS in real life. Uh, so that if you're looking for a job or you're just trying to hone some of your skills, uh, this video is going to be for you. And the good news is that I'm going to be making videos on each of these different projects that I'm going to put in front of you today uh, so that if you try it and you get stuck, don't worry, I'm going to show you how to do it later. Okay, so that's what this video is going to be about. So let's start with it by looking at our first project. And we're going to start simple and progress a little bit uh, to more advanced topics as we go along. So the first one is static website hosting. This is probably the most common thing that you see when people are suggesting uh, learning AWS. It's just start with a basic website and host it on S3. So let's take a look at how this may work if you're trying to set up this project. So the first thing that you do is you upload a index.html file to S3. And just as a reminder, S3 is your all purpose data store for storing um, raw objects of a variety of different sizes and types. Uh, for this purpose, this would just be an index. Uh, .html file that contains some just raw JavaScript. You can also upload your uh, CSS or JavaScript assets as well. Um, from there, we, we get an ugly URL after we do that. Although this index.html is publicly accessible, the URL will be very ugly. Uh, from there, you want to hook this up to Route 53. And Route 53 is where you would edit your DNS settings um, for your AWS account. So you can set up a domain that maps your custom domain to your index.html file. So uh, you can get something like beabetterdev.com and that'll point to uh, this index.html file. And you can stop there if you want. So if a user is accessing your website or trying to access your website through Chrome, uh, they would just type in your website name. It would go to row 53. That would resolve to the S3 file. Uh, and that's totally fine. This will completely work. I would suggest though, instead of hooking it up directly, you use CloudFront, which is a edge caching service that is very cost effective for resources that change uh, not so often. So instead of going directly to S3, you tell Route 53 to go to CloudFront instead, and CloudFront would then synchronize its data with S3, and it'll deploy your files to different edge nodes that are located all across the world for optimal performance. Um, so this is a very simple thing. If you already know how to do this, maybe you can skip over it. But for beginners, this is probably the most common example of things that uh, folks tell beginners to learn is just get familiar with the basic concepts. And the good news is that if you choose to learn these different things, CloudFront, S3, and RHEL 53, that's something you just need to know if you're going to be working with AWS. Uh, so these are skills that are going to apply outside of this example. All right, so let's move on to the next one here. And this is a CRUD app. And by CRUD, I mean create, read, update, and delete. So let me just erase all this and reveal what we have. Okay, so we're gonna be using a Docker containers for this. So uh, optionally, you can do this with EC2, but uh, I'm gonna do it using ECS, which stands for Elastic Container Service. Uh, and this allows you to upload Docker um, files to the cloud and deploy them using a managed service called ECS. So how this works from a practical perspective, some of the things that you're gonna to need to do are, first you're gonna to need to write your Docker file, then you're gonna upload the image to ECR, which stands for Elastic Container Repository. And think of ECR kind of like a S3 that's dedicated for Docker images. That's essentially what it is. Then when you set up your ECS uh, service, what you're gonna do is point, a, point it to an ECR image, and that's gonna be the image that's used for the service. When you set up your ECS cluster as well, you're gonna to have to put it within a VPC, and a VPC stands for Virtual Private Cloud. It's essentially a way in which your resources are isolated from other AWS customers. Think of it like a uh, cloud-based data center, essentially. That's kind of what it is. And you're shielded from what other customers are doing. No one's able to access your network. Uh, you're able to lock down all the ports. 
um, and, and everything to do with networking within this application. So you're gonna have to launch your ECS cluster into a VPC. Uh, you're gonna wanna set up a RDS database, which in this example is just using uh, AWS RDS with MySQL, which is very easy to set up. I have a video on setting this up as well, and on ECS actually. Actually, I have a video on a bunch of these different things. I'll put links in the description section below. Um, and then you're gonna want to code up your uh, application code so that it interacts with this RDS instance. From there, you're gonna wanna set up a load balancer um, so that you can distribute load across multiple different containers that you're hosting. And so you would point your load balancer to your ECS endpoint. And then you, again, you'd create a Route 53 DNS entry to map your domain name to your load balancer. And then finally, when someone comes along and tries to hit your website, of course, it'll go to Route 53 first. It'll hit the load balancer. The load balancer will distribute the request to one of the containers on ECS. And then, you know, it'll go to RDS and uh, retrieve your data, create your data, update it, whatever you're trying to do, and return that all the way back to the caller. So I would consider this to be a very good example because this is what people are usually doing these days. Serverless really seems to take over. Um, if you're using ECS, you can you have two options, running it in a serverless way using Fargate or running it in a non-serverless way using EC2. I would suggest Fargate for this example, just to get familiar. The EC2 one is a little bit more complicated, requires some different permissions to change, uh, security group settings, a whole bunch of VPC networking things that you'll need to know about there. But I think Fargate is a good way to start. Um, again, this is a very useful example. A lot of applications these days are built using a very similar uh, framework than what I just showed you here. So uh, definitely, definitely, definitely invest the time in learning through this example. Okay, so let's move on to the third one, which is gonna be more in terms of data processing, which is an interesting one. Uh, so I had fun putting this one together, and this is going to be fun when I actually build this thing because uh, it's kind of interesting. So let's talk about what this is, and this is going to be aimed at consuming Twitter uh, streams or consuming Twitter tweets, I should say, rather. Uh, so Twitter has an endpoint where you can read off of live streaming tweets as they come in, and all it requires is setting up a developer account and getting an API key. Uh, so what you would do is just write a Python script that's going to consume data from that stream. And it can be consuming that data constantly or on a timer or something you may choose. Uh, and it's going to consume individual tweets there. And then uh, what we're going to do there to process this data is we're going to put the tweets to a Kinesis Firehose endpoint. I have a uh, video on Kinesis Firehose that you should check out. It's great for batching and data processing. So what Kinesis Firehose is going to do is we're going to set it up so that every five megabytes worth of data or every five minutes, whichever comes first, we're going to take all that data and put it into one file and dump that into S3. So Kinesis Firehose, by the way, it does all of this automatically. Like doing these things is just clicking buttons. It's very, very easy to actually set this stuff up. And there's a whole bunch of different parameters that you can set as well. Uh, so every five megabytes or five minutes, we're gonna deliver a file to S3. We're gonna wire up our S3 bucket that we allocate for this data to a put notification. And that put notification is gonna trigger a Lambda function. So this Lambda function is gonna be invoked every time a file is uploaded to S3. Now the payload of the notification or what's inside the, the notification is just gonna be the location and the name of the file that was created. So it'll be like index.csv. Um, or data.csv or something like that. From there, we need to code our Lambda such that it goes back to S3 and actually pulls the entire file contents back. And then from there, we can index it in Elasticsearch. Now, if you've never used Elasticsearch, um, text processing is basically what it's used for, text uh, kind of querying. It's used in a lot of um, autocomplete databases or, you know, when you're searching on Google and there's autocomplete, you type a character, something comes up. Elasticsearch is usually the technology behind the scenes or something like it um, to give you that kind of functionality. So in this case, it would be great for analyzing text. So we would take that entire file contents, upload that into Elasticsearch so that we can analyze it. And the cool thing about Elasticsearch on AWS is that it comes pre-installed with Kibana. And Kibana is like a UI uh, for this stuff and it'll show you kind of trends over time. And uh, the, you can also do things like word clouds or, or different types of queries by different grouping mechanisms. So it's a very intuitive and easy way to observe and analyze your data through the comfort of a UI. And all of that data is gonna be sitting inside Elasticsearch. So that's how we would access it. 
So I think this is a pretty good example that allows you to touch on a lot of different technologies for the purpose of data processing. Uh, so I'd highly encourage you to check this one out. Let's move on to the fourth and final example now. And yeah, so this one's kind of fascinating. I just came up with this uh, a few hours ago, and this is a distributed serverless workflow for stock price movements. And the motivation for this one is, I'm sure some of you were following GME or GameSpot and uh, you wanted to know when it was rising or falling very rapidly. You couldn't sit at your computer all day just looking at a stock price. Uh, so the, the idea here is to set up a distributed uh, serverless workflow that will automatically detect when jumps or drops occur in very short intervals in a stock price. Okay, so I, I think it's pretty interesting given what's happened in the world pretty recently. Uh, so what are we going to be using here? So there's a bunch of different pieces. And let me just center this on the screen so you don't get distracted. Okay, so first of all, we're going to be using CloudWatch events. And uh, we're going to set them up so that a CloudWatch event triggers on one minute timers. Think of these things like cloud based cron jobs. And I have a video on these, by the way, that you can learn more. Um, but Essentially, you set a timer based on some interval or some day of the week cadence. Um, in this case, we'll just do it every minute. And from there, this is going to be kind of our, our way to trigger our workflow. So it's going to be happening every minute. So we're going to set up CloudWatch so that it sends a notification to SQS. And SQS is called uh, stands for Simple Queue Service. It's a great way to back pressure or have back pressure for processing in your application. Uh, so it's going to signify that there's a job to be done. We're going to hook up our Lambda function to SQS so that anytime a message gets put in SQS, our Lambda function is going to wake up and perform whatever it's going to do. Now, what is it going to do? Well, it's going to go to Yahoo Finance API, which has a great API that you can access uh, if you're interested in a price for a particular ticker. Uh, we can use, I know I said GME, so let's just keep on going. Uh, with that example here. So we're going to query for GME. It's going to give us back things like stock price, number of shares that are available, all that kind of stuff. We'll consume that data and then we're going to index it in a DynamoDB database. So this is going to be a completely serverless example. There's no servers here involved at all, which is uh, kind of a neat thing and where the industry seems to be going as a whole. So we're going to index that data in uh, DynamoDB for every tick basically every one minute we're going to have a different row that says the stock price was this at this time so if we think of like a table like this uh, if we have t1 for instant one and then t2 for instant two or maybe this is minute one minute two and this is our price uh, we, maybe we would have something like eight dollars in at the first minute and then ten dollars in the second minute. So you can see here the jump between these two minutes is very high. It's a $2 difference. And it's, and if you convert this to percent, it's a pretty large percent. So we would want to send out a notification or somehow become aware when this happens. So the question is, how do we do that? Well, uh, the way I want to do it just for the purpose of teaching you more things in this example, and this isn't necessarily the best way to do it, but it teaches you different concepts. Um, is I would hook up this DynamoDB table using DynamoDB streams. And DynamoDB streams allow you to detect change events. So when we wire this up to our Lambda function, every time a record gets inserted in the database, say T2 gets inserted into the database in this example, we're gonna get a notification sent to our Lambda function and it's gonna show us the entire contents of the record. So all this data that exists in the row. Um, so we're going to take that data, then we're going to query again, we're going to go back to Dynamo, but we're going to look for T1, which is the minute before it, and then compute this difference. And if the difference is significant enough, maybe beyond a certain percentage, we're going to send a notification through simple email service to our phones so that we get a text message or an email to say, hey, Daniel, the stock price dropped or the stock price raised by X amount, go and buy or sell some shares. Uh, so I thought this was a pretty fascinating example. So I think these are four examples that are great for learning AWS from a very practical perspective. All of these things are things that you would probably have to do at some point in your career, maybe not interact with stock prices or the Twitter API, but uh, the technologies that you're gonna be using are very interchangeable with different use cases. So I'd highly suggest you try some of these projects out. And if you get lost, don't worry. Like I said, I'm gonna have videos coming out on each of these different projects and I'm gonna be doing them and walking you through how to do them. So look forward to that as well. If you liked the video, don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you next time. Thanks so much guys.